So indeed, um, I, I selected a kind of provocative title, but uh, it's very much based on uh, what I experience in the IT industry, in the software industry, where I have been in the last 30 years, uh, in which basically the hardware has become kind of less important than the software and the cloud, the way to deliver it as a service has taken over. So the, what I will cover is um, to share a few thoughts about uh, uh, this topic. The future of medical devices is uh, software defined and what does it mean for the marketing approach in this health tech world where software becomes a, a more important ingredient uh, for medical device vendors. Um, so the, the agenda, first, uh, you might not know yet uh, everybody Medisante. Um, it's pretty normal. We are a startup, um, about uh, 20 plus people based in Switzerland, uh, but with uh, global ambitions. And um, so I will quickly give the overview of who we are, what is our vision. Uh, then, you know, I will position, you know, the, the story about um, software defined, what can it mean or could it mean? And um, what I see as a kind of change in the, the space we're in from connected devices to something where what matters is not the device, but the outcome, which is a, within a care process. So that's why we, we call it connected care. And uh, last but not least, um, you know, I will just share my own experience, which is pretty limited uh, in this company because I, I invested into it uh, one year ago and I've been driving the whole marketing and uh, sales strategy over the last uh, 12 months almost. So how to make the most of these new technologies, cloud, internet of things and uh, in a B2B model, I, I basically understand uh, nothing, have no experience in B2C. So I've been 30 years in B2B, so I, I really focus on this. Okay, so the, the Medisante vision is um, to, to help nations uh, save costs. Uh, when it comes to chronic conditions, so chronic conditions, um, hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular issues, uh, those type of uh, issues, uh, because there is a, a huge amount of money at stake uh, if uh, nations and uh, healthcare systems manage to keep people uh, longer at home rather than send them in a, in a hospital or in, in another type of institution. So this is really what we want to, to achieve in the, in the long run. So as I said, uh, why is it relevant? Because um, today, if you take the um, healthcare budget of a nation, um, it's between 10 and 12% of the GDP in most countries in uh, Western Europe. And uh, in fact, chronic conditions, uh, of course, you have to die of something, but um, at the end of the day, the costs uh, related to chronic conditions are, are huge. They are between 70 and 80 percent of uh, the healthcare budget. And um, these, um, these chronic conditions are ultimately the, the number one cause of mortality. I don't like to call it killer, you know, it has something a bit, uh, uh, something of a uh, salvage, but um, uh, you see what I mean. Um, so, so first of all, um, we believe that uh, this is relevant because there is, there is money at stake. You know, when something weighs 80% of 10% uh, of the GDP, um, you just, uh, it's easy to understand that uh, reducing it by whatever percentage or per mil has uh, an impact which uh, is in billion of euro or dollar. Um, so um, we really want to to achieve savings uh, by dealing more efficiently with those chronic conditions. And um, so today we can say that um, probably most of you, I don't know, um, may I just ask, um, do some of you do home office at least one day a week? Okay, everybody, almost 70%. <laughs> I think the caregivers, it's probably one of the only trades in which um, probably 99% of the caregivers, they really exercise their art, their, 
their expertise face to face with the patient. Uh, but we believe that now there is an opportunity uh, to, to have them scale their medical expertise beyond the four walls of their practice, their hospital, their clinic, by basically making data available that uh, come directly from medical devices, from people, from patients who are at home. And um, what we call patient-generated health data. So patient-generated health data are the the readings that come uh, that are coming from those medical devices, people use them themselves at home. And uh, the story is that uh, so far, for a caregiver to have access to this uh, data was like uh, requiring 10 years of more study in IT interoperability, you know, to on top of the 10 years of uh, medical study, they had to do a 10 year PhD in, med in IT interoperability to, to capture the bubbles of data coming uh, from 6,000 global clouds, you know, something, something daunting and uh, which is completely ir irrealistic, you know, for a single caregiver. So the, the, the second thing, you know, why we believe there, there are cost savings um, is that, um, um, you know, even myself, 20 years ago, I, I went with my father, you know, he was holding hand, he went to the local bank and he said, uh, he would talk to a nice chap in, the, in my hometown, he said, um, I want 22 francs. And the human being asked him, do you want uh, two banknotes of 10 or do you want one banknote of 20? My father, multiple choice, you know, like at McDonald's, uh, do you want Big Mac, Big Mac with cheese or without, you know, so. Okay, it was a conversation with a human being. And um, the reality is that um, since then, you know, all these people who had this night conversation in banks um, have disappeared. You know, you can no longer go to a, a bank and ask for 22 uh, units of whatever currency on the world because uh, there are automatic tellers at every corner of the street which means that basically the, the banking industry has um, delegated some tasks uh, that were handed by uh, people uh, they paid, there were employees at the desk and they handed them out to the, the client himself and uh, build the machine where everybody now is withdrawing the cash. And uh, I believe that basically um, in the medical profession there will be a similar trend. Uh, today you have still uh, caregivers, doctors uh, who take blood pressure, you know, uh, once a quarter to their thousand chronic patients, you know, they have a routine visit once a quarter. They go to the, the practice to measure blood pressure, you know. Amazing if you think of it, you know. So, well, we believe that um, in 20 years' time, uh, if you look backward, uh, you will have the same impression of the current situation than if we now look backward on the guy giving you 22 francs or euro and asking you if you want uh, two notes of 10 or if one of 20 will be okay, you know. You know, we really believe that um, taking blood pressure, blood glucose, weight, all this will be done completely delegated to the patient. He will do it wherever he is, wherever he lives. And there will be uh, IoT technologies, you know, telecom technologies, cloud technologies that will make sure that uh, this data in the right format uh, is displayed on a screen to a doctor. And based on it, uh, he has the actionable insight to make a medical decision. Either everything is in the green zone, so why call him to a quarterly visit if the data is good? Uh, but if it's not good, uh, maybe rather than ending up in a catastrophe, like uh, the data deteriorates, the patient underestimates the importance, the gravity of the topic, of the issue. So he doesn't go to the doctor anyway, I go to the doctor in two weeks. No, I mean, if the doctor then looks at the data, sees it's really bad, you know, he, he can trigger an interaction, say, what's going on? Did you take your pill? Uh, let's do a complimentary test. Uh, I call you to the, to the practice now. I think we should do a, a visit which, uh, which is a bit uh, heavier. So he can anticipate to prevent catastrophes. And so basically, um, all, all these prevention of catastrophes 
due to the lack of uh, real-time data, uh, when the data goes, goes south, of course, um, generates a huge cost in the healthcare industry. And uh, having this data real-time at the fingertip of the doctor, on a screen, on a dashboard, with some filter capabilities, um, should help reduce this cost. Uh, to me, you know, it seems pretty obvious, but uh, now, is it um, mainstream? No, it's one per mil of the reality today, but uh, will it become 1% or 5% or 10% in the next three years? Yes, I believe so, because uh, of the cost pressure on the national healthcare systems. And uh, the last point is um, in the medical industry, when you talk about health data, uh, of course, you cannot just have a consumer approach with global cloud, you know, uh, where the patient, uh, who is in fact um, a customer, a consumer, uh, downloads a mobile app and then he clicks yes to everything. And uh, at the end, his data are in the USA, in Ukraine, in China, depending on the, the, the builder of the mobile app. And, uh, you know, really, if it's a care process where the doctor is in charge, uh, then there is a legal obligation, there are regulations uh, by which the data, the health data needs to be held in country. So today there is no director of a hospital or a clinic or a national healthcare system, a civil servant in a national healthcare civil s system who would say, oh yeah, you know, let's uh, propagate all these mobile apps and the data are in Ukraine, that's a safe place, you know, we're in France, but it doesn't matter, you know. Basically, if, if somebody in charge uh, would take such a decision. In fact, he would just uh, not comply with the most basic regulations. And this is one of the reasons why today most of these uh, fashion with mobile apps doing stuff in the healthcare area are a kind of consumer fad for healthy people who count their steps. But they are pretty irrelevant in terms of ability to save costs of a national healthcare system, which is when it starts to become interesting, you know, in a, in a, at a macro level. So um, we believe that this opportunity to save cost is real. Um, if you have been, if you have been watching other industries, it's pretty obvious that face-to-face um, -face can just be one part of doing the job for a caregiver. But over time, there will be a care continuum where there will be face-to-face -face interaction. Of course, still very, very important, but there will be also in between visits increasingly be digital interactions and, and um, digital data feed uh, coming from medical devices directly on the screen of the doctor. Okay, so now, oh, I went back, That's, um, I thought I already did that, it was not uh, Alzheimer, it's just I put the, push the wrong button. So, software-defined medical devices. Of course, this vision of patient-generated health data landing on the screen of the doctor doesn't happen by magic. You know, it means that uh, you need to have some software somewhere in the in the process. Um, so, I I I I heard from from you that uh, I've been 30 years in the software industry. It's true. Uh, as I said, it sometimes scared me, but it was a very passionate time because every time I thought if I fall asleep or if I, like I'm, if I were a tortoise and hibernate six months, when I wake up, I would have the impression, I would have had the impression that uh, the world had completely changed every six months. So I have been 30 years in this environment that was evolving so fast that it was never boring. So it was a, a great experience, but um, the more recent experience, in fact, I was at a company called uh, VMware, and uh, basically they have uh, invented um, a virtualization technology, which uh, is in fact a software abstraction layer that, um, that abstracts the hardware servers from Dell, from HP, from IBM, and sees them as a big pool. And uh, this virtualization technology is the, the foundation of the cloud because basically it allows IT people to deliver a, a technical service, computing power, storage, uh, network capabilities, wherever the hardware is. It can be somewhere in the world, you know, the people who benefit from it as a service 
They are, there is no direct link between where the server is physically and where the, the benefit of information of this computing power is. So this company I worked on, on in the last seven years, I saw how they went from basically zero people to 20,000 people because their vision was um, that the world would be software defined, delivered as a service. And I saw, you know, really in the last seven years how this vision, which was so powerful for IT infrastructure people, you know, system administrators, that uh, it started really to rule the world and the cloud was becoming completely dominant in everybody's life. And um, they were also breaking the silos, you know, between brand. It was when you ask somebody uh, 10 years ago to go back to my analogy of uh, the, the guy uh, with the, 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 the with handing out some banknotes, uh, when you were asking a system admin in this IT infrastructure space 10 years ago, um, your data center, your data center, what is it about? He said, ah, it's top to bottom IBM or he said it's top to bottom HP. But you know, it was top to bottom a hardware vendor. And then came this virtualization technology, you know, like uh, doing hopus popus, virtualizing, abstracting the IBM, the HP, etc. And so this means that there was a transversal software layer that was abstracting the hardware. So they were kind of breaking the silos of the brands of the hardware. But at the end, uh, it allowed the system administrator to deliver a new server within three minutes, while before in the physical world, you know, where you take a server, you put it into the data center, it took like three weeks or two months for somebody from the business to get what he needed, which was server computing power capabilities. So this virtualization really allowed to reduce, to collapse, the time of delivering computing power from months to minutes. And this was, of course, good for the business. So, so I, I, I come with, in the back of my head, all this history I've seen, I've experienced it. And when I met the founder of Medisante uh, in the train, he told me what he was about to do, you know, like, uh, yeah, I, I have founded the company, it's not yet where it should be, but basically I would like to deliver data to the doctor based on different medical device, measuring different things. He has been working in uh, medical device companies. Um, uh, maybe some of you are from these companies. He was uh, in product management worldwide at uh, Ipsomed. He was in product management at Bernafon, the hearing aids. So he said, I, I'm trying internally to propagate the vision that we need to go to software and across several morbidity conditions or technologies, devices, but it was like impossible to establish that vision because the mainstream and the existing business was way too big and uh, it was like a howly cow, you know, so you, nobody could touch it. So he created his company with the vision and ultimately implemented it. Okay, so, so if I look, I, I told you before, you know, there is this with, with these connected devices, I think, of course, either the devices, the medical equipment are not connected, which is still very often the case, but if they are connected, we see two generations of connectivity. The first generation is this one. I quickly describe the attributes. It's what I call consumer-grade Internet of Things. It's uh, very much in silo, as you can see. Basically, you have, let's say, um, a device, uh, you can buy it in a retail store or in a pharmacy. It's a Bluetooth device. You connect it at home. You download the mobile app. You connect it via Bluetooth. You search for the Wi-Fi. And then you take your blood pressure. And then the data, you, you, say, you say you approve everything and the data goes somewhere. And at the end, you, the data gets sent to a global cloud. And uh, at, the, at the end, the person who measured the, 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 his vital signs, whichever one, he looks at his own data. So the question to you is, who is missing in this process? The doctor. <laughs> There's no doctor. So imagine today the reality is that over the last five years or the last seven years, there has been a proliferation of probably 100 mobile apps in every silo. 
probably hundreds of devices in every silo. And if you multiply all the, you do the math of multiplying, uh, you end up with a huge complexity where the guy you overwhelm most is the caregiver because he would need to gather all this data from global clouds and he's just unable to do it. So the reality today, although these devices and these mobile apps have a huge benefit in terms of awareness of health status for the patient, which is very important, the, when the patient goes to the caregiver at the, the, the practice, you know, every, every patient comes, ah, look at my data, ah, look at my data. So the, re the natural reaction of the caregiver is because he doesn't know what to do out of it. There are so many mobile apps, so many devices, he doesn't know if it's reliable, he's not in charge. So the first wave, the last five to seven years of um, connected devices, where the device was a uh, middle center, was really this type of, um, of technology. So what we have done is we have kind of broken the, um, these, these some assumptions of how it should be, and we have simplified the capture process. So we said uh, the medical device needs to be autonomous. It cannot just be an accessory of a mobile phone. So we have inserted, inserted a SIM card with a Gemalto and Vodafone that transmits data in an autonomous way. So there's just a medical device. No need for Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, uh, smartphone, because people who are 75 years old, you know, you tell them, go home, uh, do all, everything I described to you before, you know, they're overwhelmed. So here they just take, they put the cuff, they push a button, the data goes directly on the screen of a, of a medical doctor. So it's much simpler and it's driven by the doctor. So the doctor decides to set up a patient to put him under telemonitoring. He sets the target, he looks or his assistants at the screen, etc. And uh, the, the net net is that uh, we call it intelligent connected care because the value is not in the device. It's in the data provided to the doctor. And uh, in a nutshell, you know, the doctor will see all his patients with vital sign reading coming from several conditions. And um, then there will be some alerts because in 90% of the case it will be good, but if it's not good, uh, then, then it's time to intervene. So basically we, we see um, if I put myself into the product management role, you know, what, what is the value of product management? In fact, first is to articulate the change. Because, you know, if people understand that there are big gen chunks of generations, then, you know, they, they have the map, they have the, the compass where they are and where they can go next. So I believe that uh, we are going out of a huge consumer-grade con connected device generation and we're entering a medical grade connected care generation. And first of all, being aware of that, it's a first step then to position the solutions. Because if nobody believes that in the current generation there's a problem, small problems, like uh, there's not a single caregiver who knows what to do out of this, small, small, but still, then you can start to address it. So, what we have today as a, as a solution is basically a set of devices all equipped with a SIM card that transmit data across the world via Vodafone network to a, a dashboard, a caregiver, to the caregiver directly. But in the future, uh, we have done this now with three or four devices. Needless to say that if uh, there is an equipment manufacturer who scratches his head because he's answering tender and there is a box that says, are your equip is your equipment connected? And um, hmm, well, not yet, we're thinking of it. Um, let's talk to engineering and let's say in five years time, maybe we can tick the box, you know. So maybe this is a risk uh, for some uh, vendors that uh, the connectivity that is kind of expected in the new tender is not a given. So of course we can basically, with what we have been through, connect any device the same way we have done so far. So the mission we have defined is to put the Internet of Things to work for caregivers and um, we connect them directly to these patient-generated health data. So the caregivers at the end, they have a cross-condition view 
of the patient. They can, we can add artificial intelligence and ultimately we have the data to measure efficiency. So if I look at the technology, I think I kind of covered it, but um, um, the, the point is it's all about involving all the, the stakeholders, the people who pay, the, who own the budget, the, the agencies, the national healthcare agencies, the caregivers, they have the actionable insights they didn't have, the patient, they want to stay at home, you know, but they want to have the peace of mind that the doctor is monitoring their, their, their vital signs. And so it's important to be clear about the benefits for multiple stakeholders, because if one is not involved, in fact, it, the system will not evolve. And um, so what we have done is really to accomplish the mission, to, to go against the mainstream thinking, which is no, it's not an add-on of a mobile app. Why? So we put SIM card. Then, no, it's not in silo, mobile app 1 to 600, and I show it to the caregiver. So we build a real SaaS platform for the doctor, cross condition. And third, no, it's not a global cloud for consumers who are healthy. It's a local, <laughs> local database with health data, extremely sensitive data uh, that is hosted in the country. So, you know, um, so, the, so my, my, my conclusion, and sorry, I think I'm, I'm slightly um, uh, over time, um, so what we challenged is uh, mainstream thinking that the medical device, an add-on, an accessory of a smartphone, really? Well, we don't believe this is the case. Then, um, you know, there were thousands of pilots to telemonitor chronic patients with this uh, smartphone setup, but everybody realized after three months that it was way too clunky for elderly people, you know? So it never scaled. So why doesn't it scale? Well, because it's too clunky. So let's change the clunkiness and let's put a SIM card into every device, make it autonomous, et cetera, et cetera. Then, uh, you know, it's, um, it's difficult when you're in a business to say, um, to think in a disruptive way. So usually you add a little thing that doesn't disturb the mainstream. And uh, well, you know, the problem is that adding a little bit of something that disturbs nobody usually leads nowhere really new. And, um, and in fact, we are moving from consumer driven to, to care, to health care driven, to care, to a care process in the hands of a doctor. And um, so it's more about building enterprise grade platforms for the caregivers than having millions of apps for consumers. And, um, but for sure, you know, these Internet of Things type of technologies have a huge potential. And it's in combination with the, the right type of cloud approach hosted in country that brings the value uh, to all these stakeholders, the cost saving for the, the nations, the actionable insights for the caregivers, and uh, basically the autonomy staying at home for the, the patients. So it's all about challenging the status quo. Um, rethinking IT topics, uh, rethinking business model. We're very much in a telco type of subscription model. Like when you buy your cell phone, you know, you, you don't buy a cell phone, you pay a monthly fee to get a service. And uh, we have paid a lot of attention to what's in for which stakeholder. So that was it. Uh, welcome, in a new, welcome to a new world of intelligent connected care. <laughs> Thank you, Giles. Very impressive indeed. I think um, it opens up a lot of questions for the audience over here as well, those who have apps and uh, products for the consumers. So I think time will tell where we all end up. Um, before we break for lunch, any quick questions from the audience? Yes, just a quick question. We were, we were wondering here, uh, who is the owner of the data? That will be the patient and that will be the, the health so, provider? Yeah, so by... by by default, by law, the owner of the data is always the patient. Uh, but um, if the patient is part of a medical telemonitoring program uh, that is uh, driven by the caregiver, uh, it's really the caregiver who has a one-to-one -one discussion with the patient, for instance, at his practice, he will say, I think uh, I will prescribe you this pill for blood pressure, against blood pressure. I would like to monitor the, your vital signs remotely. 
I set you up in the system. I allocate in my system this medical device with this unique identifier. You just have to go home and measure. And then I will see your data. So of course there is a consent where the doctor or the medical team, mm -hmm. because you know the doctor is more in the one-to-one -one interaction, but he has a medical assistant who do the monitoring on the screen. So there, there is a, a consent, which is indeed an important part of the whole process. But um, the legal answer is the data belongs to the patient. But in this case, if the process is in the hands of the doctor, uh, the doctor has access uh, if the patient agrees on the process. Mm, thank you. Uh, just another question, sorry, that just came up to my mind. Some of the ca some countries around the world, and especially small countries, are now looking at integrating all data, or, or I don't know how to say, but to, to, to have this um, data trans patient data transparency in the way that the patient moves from one hospital to another hospital, the second hospital will have fully um, transparency, uh, will have fully visibility to this data. Mm -hmm. So in the case of your product, that will be a uh, So, a so you know, so very, very good question. Um, so we, we just uh, announced um, a marketing collaboration with uh, Siemens Health Seniors. And uh, Siemens, for instance, has a solution, but uh, I guess there are other players who try to address the same interoperability challenge, uh, by which basically um, today, if you take a country, uh, there are probably 20, 50 major healthcare software providers. Then the patient goes to clinic one, clinic two, there are two different software vendors where he stores his data. Uh, but the, what is happening right now is that there are based on a unique identity of this patient and some interoperability capabilities, which is about software also. You know, basically there are increasingly solutions, which is a kind of um, infrastructure backbone that basically taps into these sources of data with different formats and different vendors, etc. So you, they will basically tap uh, the radiology stuff, the, the lab stuff, the whatever, you know, whatever can medically is available. Yeah. Then they format it in a unique way, which then they disclose with um, different rules of access rights uh, that are driven by the patient. You know, the patient needs to say which data in this portal, either for the patient or for the caregiver, he wants to make available. So, um, so these were early days in, in this process. Uh, but uh, yes, based on a unique identity, there are technologies today that uh, grab all these pieces of data and all these disparate system and make them available in a unified portal where you see the full history wherever he has been and wherever the data were stored uh, originally. So, and uh, basically we will be part of such a portal because uh, we also have the challenge that we do not want to create additional silos in every organization. So it's very important and based on this mapping of a unique identity for the patient, you know, you have this integrated view. Okay. Very good, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Giles. Um, okay, one yeah. last question. <laughs> Hello, thank you very much. Sorry, this is very two interesting. Questions then. <laughs> <laughs> one for you, one for him. Okay. Um, so you started talking about it on the business model, if you can explain a bit. So um, you have a subscription model and then you have reimbursement for this and how does it work now? And I think it's a bit related to the question also that was before. How do you see your business model evolving in the future when you potentially will involve data that is more scalable and not only director, uh, direct doctor mm -hmm. patient? Mm -hmm. Okay, so there are different questions. So. Um, you know, um, as we went away from this uh, smartphone, Bluetooth type of thinking, we have a bet uh, that data transmission will be done on a global telco a network, which is the one of Vodafone. So this, the SIM card we have in the, in the device works wherever the patient is. It just sends the data, whether you are in Germany, in France, in Australia, to the doctor who set you up in his monitoring platform. So this means that we had a very much a telco-minded technology approach to the solution we built. And as we had this 
telco mindset on the technology side, we also ended up having a telco mindset in the business model and the pricing. So we kind of stole the subscription model uh, that we're all familiar with, where when you buy a mobile device, when you buy a smartphone, you know, uh, if you commit to a um, three-year contract, you know, your monthly fee is a bit lower, um, et cetera, et cetera. If you have a big data pack, you know, you might pay more. If you have a small one, you might pay less. If you include America or China, you might pay more. If you exclude it, um, you pay less. So we have a very similar um, model uh, based on subscription. Uh, that includes uh, three things. Um, first, the usage of the SaaS platform for the caregiver and the patient, because both have access to their data, the ones they can see. Uh, then there is a telecom data transmission included in the service. And of course, there is a device included in the service that the patient is using at home. So basically, we have a subscription model based on a monthly fee uh, that includes these three components. Um, and, uh, but then, of course, there are some subtleties like um, some, some organizations, because we're exclusively in a B2B model, you know, you, nobody can buy a device from us uh, at the corner of a street in a pharmacy, you know, we, we want to sell 10,000 devices to whatever care organization. So, um, of course, then some care organization might say, uh, I want to own the device. You know, in their accounting, they don't, do not want to rent. They want to own or they want to lease. So basically, we have three options for the um, ownership or not ownership of the devices, which is uh, they can, in this subscription model still, there are an option where they can buy them, rent them, or lease them. So th this is a, a first uh, level of answer. So the is, does it answer your, your question? Uh, yeah, most of it. Okay. I was just curious, so is it at state level? There is reimbursement for this or is so it no. So, you know, so let's say the following today, we're like 20 people. Um, I tell you, if Andorra introduced reimbursement, you know, I would need to, <laughs> to put some steel pockets because, you know, <laughs> Now, because imagine Andorra and Liechtenstein start, you know, where we would already struggle, you know, to deliver on the demand. So, but my, my real belief is that um, over the next three years, we will move from a pilot stage, like let's imagine the future, you know, like 20 years ago, you know, what could we do, you know, to save cost of the guy who asks uh, two notes of 10 or one of 20? You know, so people think, what could the future be for chronic conditions? So the, right now, uh, every state is burning innovation money. They say, let's imagine the future, do a pilot to do this, and they figure it out. You know, they need to experiment. So experimentation is what happens today. But some experimentation will end up being successful, not the ones with Bluetooth devices, that's for sure, you know, it's proven, but some will, and then at a certain stage, if some pilots are able to scale for a multitude of reasons, then at a certain time in the next two to five years, a reimbursement will kick in for some use case in some countries, so, you know, if you ask me when will it kick in, then uh, if you know, uh, you should, uh, we will hire you to write <laughs> our business plan because the only thing we don't know, you know, if the curve goes up like this now or in three years or in five years, and you're right, it will depend on when there is ev enough evidence that there are cost savings which in my opinion will exist for obvious reasons, but um, first we need to prove it. And uh, also uh, once there is a proof, there is evidence that the outcome uh, is there as well, you know, that we, we save lives. For instance, in after being discharged from a hospital, you know, if, if the patient has had, for instance, heart surgery, we, there are pilots right now where there is this evidence. If you give him a, way, a body composition scale, you monitor his weight. Suddenly, if the, there is a spike in weight, in fact, it means the percentage of water in the body is going up. 
And everybody knows that uh, if it goes into the lungs, uh, you know, it's not a good idea for the patient because uh, he has the option between, uh, you know, going in emergency to the hospital or worst case to die. So, so there are already initiatives that might be the first candidates for reimbursement in, in some countries because the case is so obvious and the last two or three years the evidence has been collected but then there will be other use cases where it will take a bit more time. One last question and one very quick answer. Yeah, sorry if the answer was not quick enough. I, uh, <laughs> this time it has to be. <laughs> you. I, I can see hungry faces over here. It's not for me. <laughs> I'm afraid I have a question that doesn't have a quick answer. <laughs> How about no, asking I'm it at lunch? <laughs> <laughs> no, Please just, go ahead. Just an inspiration. I'm Augustin from ResMed. We are pretty much in connected care. Yes. And we, we've heard a lot of connected care and digital medical devices uh, in relation to patients or to healthcare providers, but uh, I think a bit qu big question is acceptance of these, uh, all, the, all these innovations by uh, payers mm -hmm. and by governments, you know, and uh, I think maybe for next sessions, uh, a year from now, it would be interesting to hear business cases where they really accept it, you know, saying, okay, I accept that you provide connected care, mm -hmm. so you save money, so... I, I push my doctors, my contractors to use, you know, this, because we haven't heard about it, really. So, I, so should I answer? Yeah, I think it was so kind of anybody has business, you know, Anybody has business case like this. I have, I have an expert at the back as well, but uh, mm. you go ahead first. <laughs> no, but it was kind of a similar question that, that uh, the lady just asked, you know. Um, Nobody knows 100%, but uh, everybody is trying in the pilots, they are driving to collect the evidence that uh, both you save cost and you have good medical outcome. Um, but I don't have a good answer, but I, I think uh, you did a good job at uh, ResMed, you know, in your area uh, to, to, to demonstrate uh, part of this. Uh, I think in the other chronic conditions, you know, like hypertension, diabetes, we're, we're still far away from that. And, uh, but uh, if, I, if I look at the technology foundation we use, I would say we're pretty close to the type of things uh, you do at uh, ResMed. And um, I believe the fact that you are successful in your area, uh, I mean, it's a it's pretty good sign and inspiring for us, but we would just want to make it broader in other areas. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you.